All right, I see a thumbs up. Oh, I see two. Awesome. I'll take that as meaning it's all working. Sweet. All right, and then I promise to remember that you all are there during our session. So um, if I do ever forget, just unmute yourselves, yell at us, and we'll make sure to include in the conversation. But we won't get started with our um, with our agenda for a little bit. We'll get started right around 12.15, Zoom folks. I feel like I have two audiences here because the camera is there and I want to face it. Are y'all good, Mike? Thank you. Awesome. Um, well, thank you all for coming. While we're eating, I know this is hard with your mouths full, but I do want to do some introductions and get to know folks in the room. Um, I'll go first because I'm standing up here and talking, but my name is Taylor Dooley. I work here for the School of Informatics and Computing as our Associate Director of Undergraduate Recruitment. So I touch everything with undergrads who are interested in our programs. Um, traditionally, that's been incoming freshmen, but we're also working with transfer and adult students, and also students here at IPI who might be interested in picking up one of our certificates or is switching into one of our programs. Um, I work with Amy Mighty, who's our Associate Dean of Student Services. She couldn't be here today, so I'm stepping in. And Alicia, do you want to introduce yourself next? Sure. Um, yeah. I'm Alicia Hadley, the Director of Undergraduate Advising and Student Support. Um, we have three advisors in the school, and we advise all of our undergraduate students and all the programs, even certificate students. Yeah. All right, so front row folks, I'll start with you. Uh, do you want to go first? Oh, sure. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Jessa Trimble. I'm the Director of Professional Development in the Health and Life Sciences Advising Center um, for University College Academic and Career Development. Okay, I'm Cameron Engel. I work in NXT as well as a career consultant with the HLS cluster. Hi, I'm Mr. Kipper. I am a career consultant for uh, Enterprise Policy Planning and also Arts Management and Human Services Cluster in ACD. Hi, Haley. Hi, everyone. My name is Kizzy Ashworth. I am an advisor in ACD for the STEM Cluster, and this is week three for me. Okay. Ooh, welcome. <laughs> Hi, I'm Kira George. I am an OLS major interested in Okay, awesome. So you're actually a student here at IPY. Well, thank you for finding your way here. Um, we're going to be talking about all the certificates, so you'll get some good information. But this is a room of advisors, so we might get into some um, technical stuff at the end. But thank you for coming. Mm -hmm. I'm Donna Clark, academic specialist for the School of Medicine, specifically radiology and imaging sciences. I have a BS MIT medical imaging technology program for already registered radiographers. Uh, non clinical track, uh -huh. and so we ask that they take at least 12 hours of higher level in something else, and usually say maybe consider a major. So I came to see if, if the certificates would fit in there. Awesome, thanks for coming. Hi, my name is Asha McCauley. I am Assistant Director of Special Programs in the SPAN Division um, and under Division of Undergraduate Education. Nicole B. Nando, I'm a lecturer in the Health Information Management Program. And I also serve as a clinical coordinator for the medical coding certificate program. Mm -hmm. And Nicole will be one of our speakers today. Hi, everyone. My name is Haley Allen. I work in the School of Science Prep's office as the assistant director of career and employer services. Mm -hmm. All right. My informatics folks in the back, do we want to start with Fozzie? Hello, everybody. My name is Fozzie. I'm a faculty of informatics in the School of Science Prep's I'm Todd Shelton, lecturer in uh, media arts and science, and I'm also the coordinator of the uh, web and mobile development certificate. I'm Bulkini, I'm a professor and chair of human centered computing, which is the department that houses many of the programs you'll be getting about, including informatics, AI, media and science, human computer interactions, and legal informatics. Mm -hmm. okay. My name is AJ Booker, I work with Taylor, I'm also the undergraduate. Everybody, my name is Zeb Wood. I am the program director for Media Arts and Science, and I'll be talking to you today about a virtual production certificate, which is hot off the press. It is. All right, and then I don't want to forget about our Zoom folks. Um, would anyone like to introduce themselves who's here on Zoom?
Hi, I'm Brian Benedict. I'm Assistant Director for Internships over in University College. Thank you, Brian. <laughs> I used to get no. Carrie yeah. Spurgeon, our academic advisor with IEPC. Thank you for coming, Carrie. Thanks for having me. All right, that's all right. I won't pick on you Zoom folks anymore, but um, thank you all for being here and for joining us. So we're pretty close to our start time on the schedule. So I'm gonna go ahead and get started. I wanna do a very brief welcome um, to everyone and just kind of explain the purpose of why we wanted to have this session here today. The School of Informatics and Computing is doing a lot of work on creating certificates and micro-credentials. And we think that these are really great opportunities for students all across campus. Um, whether they want to add this onto their degree, whether they are a student who just needs to graduate with something and is looking for a shorter credential, a shorter diploma that they can earn, um, whether they're a general studies student who wants to add this into their program, or even if they are a high school student in Spain who's looking for um, a program that they can complete here at IPY that might be shorter than a four-year program. So we think that these degrees have a lot to offer a lot of different types of students, and we want to get the word out. Today, we're going to talk about all of these, and we have our guest speakers from our school who are going to talk to you as the experts in these areas about these certificates and the curriculum and what they have to offer. Uh, we have certificates in applied data science, information science, artificial intelligence, human computer interaction, legal informatics, medical coding, multi device development, which is offered in a boot camp format, our very new software bots for cognitive automation certificate, and our very new certificate in virtual production. So a lot of these are pretty new. Um, not a lot of people on campus have had a chance to learn about them before, so that's kind of why we're here today. We're going to go until 1.30. And we're going to have time built in, in the end for Q&A, advising questions. And I'm also going to spend some time talking to you about a grant program we're a part of with the state of Indiana through the Next Level Jobs program. All right, so that's our agenda. We have a lot to get through. Let me get my physical agenda so I can remember what's coming up next. Um, but we are going to dive right into everything. And I'm going to have our instructor, Todd Shelton, come up and talk about our multi-device development certificate. I think, Todd, you're just using the website, right? Yeah, yeah. All right, you have about 10 minutes. Nice. Huh? I think I can do that. Yeah, and I'll be timing too. <laughs> All right. <laughs> well, I already said my name. It's Todd Shelton again. Everybody online, I'll try to face both of you. You know, talk, maybe I'll turn it this way. Yeah. You know, go back and forth. Um, so I'm the coordinator of, uh, I'm going to scroll down a little bit just so we can kind of see some stuff here. <clears throat> the multi-device and development certificate. And what this is, is a one semester, 18 credit hours, uh, basically a boot camp um, for web development. Um, we do all front end and we do some no SQL back end. So it could be a full stack developer when they finish an entry level. Uh, this is, I don't think I can stress this enough. It's a very intensive 18 credit hour course um, as a lot of students are finding out, uh, we recommend that they don't work full time when they take these positions or do this uh, certificate, uh, but a lot do and some make it just fine. Um, basically, you don't have to know a lot coming in to take the certificate. We start off and teach you basically anything, not knowing anything about web to all the way up to creating um, a React application, which is just a different framework for JavaScript, uh, if you guys don't know what that is. Um, and that's really a big framework that's used in the industry right now. So we uh, we finish with that and they also start using a database. We kind of give them that theory in between there too. And then they should be able to, when they, when they uh, graduate out of that certificate, get an entry level position as a front end uh, web developer or a full stack developer. So um, it's really, we've also done this certificate a little different. Um, it actually is based with six classes. So uh, it's parceled out to where if a person doesn't actually make it through one of the classes, 
they can actually just kind of withdraw from that class or not take the rest. Uh, but then just move right over into a normal semester and continue on through their progress and it will continue to move uh, with a normal uh, degree, you know. Um, so I kind of like that aspect of it. So, you know, um, again, there's six credit, uh, I mean, six classes, 18 credits. Um, they do move really quick. So it's like four weeks, four weeks. Those are the basic two courses. And then the last four uh, courses are each two weeks each and if it tells you um, there's usually when it gets to the end there's usually an assignment a day or something like that with an assessment test at the end of every week so in the beginning there's a about a, an assignment every two days so it's pretty intense and that's what you know, the reason why I keep saying that is because a lot of students tell me that every every day so um, I, I pulled up I didn't do a presentation because I actually there's a website where you guys can actually go and, and I'd rather you go here and read about it rather than me just pull up you know bullet points of I think something you like that. Todd, it shows you the yeah. out week by week what students are taking yeah <clears throat> so here's some of the um, you know what you could qualify for an application developer you know a computer sports uh, specialist a full stack web and uh, administrator and just a web developer a front-end web developer so most of the language that we use in here is all just what they consider front-end uh, language so it's really kind of based in the browser language and it's really what a person sees so i'm trying to be uh, just a some of you may not even know what that is or not so i'm trying to make it you know uh, a little bit easier to understand um, here's the breakdown and this will talk to you a little bit about what to expect First four week, we have uh, M115, and that's just the introduction course. Uh, the first two courses, the way uh, I set this up, 215 and 115, these are where a lot of students figure out this is not for me, you know. Um, and these two courses are very almost identical to the semester courses. And the reason why I did that is. Usually, since they find out this is not for me, or they find out I really like it, but this is too fast paced, they can literally move from these courses straight into a normal semester and finished out their uh, degree, which I wanted them to be able to do that, you know. And then when you get into the last few down through here, as you notice, these are two weeks. Oh, oh it's not working. There we go. Just open these up. These are all two weeks, and this gets really advanced. And these classes stray away from the normal semester courses. And the reason why is uh, because when we leave the certificate uh, in a normal semester, students have a longer time to learn more and ask more questions and, and kind of get a different feeling. And also, in a normal, um, in the full stack um, degree, uh, technology changes a little bit in four years, you know, this one, it doesn't change a lot in a semester. So we try to push everything out to get them to know what's current in the in this semester. And that's why the last four classes really kind of amp up, I guess, the technology going from let's get let's get you in there writing some web pages, understand kind of the concepts. And then the last four weeks are really uh, uh, a deep dive into some pretty hard programming. So uh, let me scroll down. And something I want to note about this is that because it's 18 credits and it is a degree that someone is pursuing, this will fall under banded tuition or IEPY. Okay. So students would pay that flat banded tuition rate instead of per credit hour. <clears throat> yeah, so there are a lot of boot camps out there for web development. Um, there's a few here in town, uh, actually. Um, so one thing that is a lot nicer, they are a little bit more pricier. I mean, with this band of tuition, it, it helps a lot as far as cost for a student, um, you know, uh, which for a lot of students, it, it makes a big deal for the cost. Um, you know, and I think the accreditation and the contacts that we have here at Indiana University also helps the student as well. Um, most of the boot camps, sorry, uh, most of the boot camps that are out there, uh, 
they are just as fast paced. Um, so students will find that out too, you know, so it's very similar to what we have here. Um, so I'm just comparing the two because we always have, hey, why well, I could just go over here and take this boot camp, you know. Uh, the biggest difference is, you know, the price is better, and we also have a good set of instructors and, you know, contacts. Uh, I think most people will find that getting jobs is all about networking at the end of the day, right? Finding the where jobs are at, and this will help. So I like to say a couple stories of students who have been good fits for this program. Um, one story, well, she hasn't studied, done it yet, but one of our student ambassadors, she's going to graduate this December with a degree in media arts and science and video production. But she took our required programming courses, she really enjoyed them, and she's going to stay an extra semester and complete the boot camp, technically after graduation, to have that additional certification for going out to the workforce. Uh, we also see an interest in adult students who have another career and want to skill up in web. Like, I think in our first cohort, we had a pastor go through the program because he during COVID learned that he needed technology skills and he did well. He graduated and mm -hmm. earned the certificate after. So I think this can be very um, a great fit for a lot of different kinds of students, whether they're currently here or want to come here just for this program. Yeah. And one thing we're not encouraging them just to come in and take the certificate and leave. One thing that's nice about this is that we encourage a student also to come in and they get their certificate and then they can get a full time position and then use tuition reimbursement from a company that they work for to come back and finish their, you know, the bachelor's degree, which that's really what we encourage. But for most a lot of students, you know, money is a big issue and that's what we really encourage and in web it does pay fairly well, uh, as you can see down there in that last paragraph up there. So uh, depending on what company you do work for. And just like Todd said, this fits neatly inside our media arts and science degree. So the student does pursue the certificate, finishes all the classes. They now have 18 credits knocked out towards that bachelor's degree. Okay. All right, I think we have one minute left of your 10 minutes. Yeah, I'm done. If anybody wants to ask questions, is it? yeah, uh, I'll probably be leaving a little bit early. So uh, just letting everybody know. So if you have a question, I'd be happy to answer it. Yeah. Um, is there any way that transfer credit can even come into this? And would they just still do the whole boot camp anyway? Is that your preference? Or do you let them sit out like a couple of weeks if they already have something? Yeah, so actually, that's a good question. And, and it's happened several times, actually. Um, for these two up at the top, for 115 and 215, we've had students actually bring in transfer credits for those. The last four, we don't. And the reason why is because they change so drastically from the regular semesters that we would really not have, like to have that in there because we already see students struggling just in these two courses, even that, that say, oh, I've had, you know, I do this before. Yeah, they struggle a lot. So we do, and then when that happens, the student actually is a part of the certificate. We add them to the courses um just so they can see and observe and then that way they kind of stay along with the rest of the cohort and then they um you know jump in when it's time you know that third class they'll just jump right in i know i'm out of time good question all right thank you Tom. <laughs> thanks everybody thank you yeah. all right so next in our busy schedule we're going to talk about our applied data science and applied information science certificates okay alt tab. alt tab Boom. Oh, right. Alt-tab. Yep. All right. So we, um, Angela Brillo is the program director for our undergraduate applied data information science degree. She couldn't be here today, but we do have a video from her on the program. So it's about three minutes long. Let's hear from Angela. I am uh, Dr. Angela Marillo, and I'll be presenting the certificate options in the applied data and information science program from the School of Informatics and Computing. So we have two certificate options available. We have one in applied information science or data studies, and students will develop skills to organize, access, curate, and manage data sets, as well as learn about the societal impacts of data work to responsibly manage data. We also have the applied data science certificate, where students will learn the math skills needed to analyze complex data sets, as well as analytics, cloud computing, and visualization. For the Applied Information Science uh, or Data Studies Certificate, 
Uh, there are six course requirements, which are 18 credit hours. There are no prerequisites, and this is a standalone certificate that is fully financial aid of eligible, as well as it's fully, uh, fully available online. The six courses are foundations of data studies, data organization and representation, data policy and governance, data analytics, or statistical learning, data creation and management, and information visualization. Information visualization may be replaced by another a relational database course such as CIT 21400, Introduction to Data Management, or CSCI and 211, Introduction to Databases, and the other uh, database um, options uh, available. So that for applied information science uh, careers, uh, students would be able to work as such as a digital curator, a data curator, a data project manager, or a document management specialist. The second certificate is in applied data science, and there are 24 credit hours or seven course um, courses that students have to take, uh, as well as nine to 10 credit hours of prerequisites, including one statistics course, one programming course, and one database course. This is also a standalone certificate and is financially aid eligible and can be fully taken online. The students would have to take a data organization and representation college algebra and trigonometry, multidimensional mathematics, introduction to statistical learning, as well as choose three from the following list, either deep learning neural networks, uh, web mining, natural language processing, visualizing data, and applied uh, cloud computing for data intensive sciences. So the types of careers that students would be uh, eligible for would be more along the lines of data scientist, data analyst, or business intelligence analyst. Now, all of these expand uh, the student's education by enhancing experience, expertise in the growing area of data-related work, expands understanding of the importance in data, of data in all fields, and provides hands-on uh, data experience that can be applied to any field. Thank you. All right, so that's some information about our two certificates related to data. Um, something that I just want to mention from my own experience talking about these certificates is that we do have a major, Bachelor of Science in Applied Data and Information Science. Within that four-year program, students either specialize in information science or in data science. So these certificates kind of track and match those two specializations. So, um, just to reiterate, information science and data science, they sound like the same thing, but they're not. Information science does have a little bit less math, but students should still be comfortable with math and should still be comfortable with statistics. That is a course that they'll have to take. So I often talk to students in other fields who don't have any background or are scared of that. I want to talk to them that there is some math, but it's okay. It's achievable. You can do it if you want to pick up these skills in data science. Um, in information science. And then on the other side of data science, which is more math focused, it is teaching them these mathematical skills they need to learn how to manipulate and understand data patterns and trends. So those are the two differences. Information science is more how we're managing, storing, um, working with data in a societal and ethical context. And that's a whole other kinds of um, career path students can go, can go down. All right, that's it for data. Next up, we have human computer interaction and legal informatics with Davide. And was there a PowerPoint? No, just the website. just the website. Perfect. Then I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, my name is Davide Bolchini. Um, welcome, everyone. I'm going to talk about the Legal Informatics Certificate and the Human Computer Interaction Certificate. Um, legal Informatics, um, the way I would uh, explain it, I think it's been around for before I came to IUPUI, probably 20 years. I've been here 14 years. I've seen this certificate as a very exciting uh, intersection between uh, the world of information technology and the world of law and policies. I think this is the first set of courses and certificate we have in our school that really touches that intersection. And if you look at that intersection, if you kind of zoom in, you see kind of two different directions. On one hand, 
You see people who develop information system who need to understand the implication of design information system for law and policies. Examples are implication for privacy, of user privacy regulation, privacy considerations, uh, but also cybersecurity and security regulation that affect the design of uh, network and systems. And on the other hand, as I work closely with the structure of the program, I discovered that from the law to information technology, there is a very interesting intersection because there are industry of software who specialize in supporting lawyers doing their daily job. For example, during a case, you know, there is a discovery phase and lawyers need to use a set of tools that are allowed to dig down into the records of the various clients, right? To find those emails, to find the documentation. So there are software and data mining tools just dedicated to support lawyers, as an example, in their everyday tasks. So if you look at that intersection, this certificate offers an online option to basically get a sense of this area. What are the uh, careers? And then we'll talk about courses. We we'll start with the careers. Careers are in a variety of areas. For example, you have electronic discovery specialists that I just mentioned, e-discovery, understanding intellectual property law or consultant, understanding contract and licenses for clients, understanding Internet of Things and cybersecurity, and also understanding specialized legal software that can be used for uh, daily practices of lawyers. The courses, um, I'm not an expert in legal informatics, but I work closely with the instructors. Our instructors are all, are all of, for this certificate, professional uh, experts, adjunct lecturers, um, who are experts in uh, information technology and the law. Many of them work for law firms of their, their own uh, law consulting. And uh, we have also serial entrepreneurs like Kim Brand, uh, who has uh, developed some of these courses over the years. So the certificate is a, a basically 15 credits, fully online uh, option for students. It includes legal and social information, informatics of security, foundation of legal informatics, electronic discovery, litigation support system. This is another aspect of using technology in a courtroom to best present your argument and your case in front of the juror, of the jury and um, the other parties, technology and the law. So these are kind of all touching, scratching the surface at that intersection. Um, who is this certificate for? I see this certificate for both kind of students. So informatics, computer science, engineering students wanted to get a sense of these aspects of law and security as affect information system. But also, for example, pre-law students we might have on campus want to start touching into informatics field from their own perspective of law regulation and their interest in law. So the, these courses are offered fall and spring semester. Some of them, like litigation, we try to offer always in the summer, depending on the schedule. But we have seen students uh, taking this fully online, fully asynchronous, 100% uh, online, some are working full time. And um, our uh, agents are in touch with them synchronously, and they've been uh, working pretty well with our students. So this is for legal informatics, this is my pitch. Any questions or? Uh, a story I want to tell really yes. fast. One of our ambassadors is an informatics major, but he's picking up the legal informatics certificate because his career goal is to become a lobbyist around technology and legal and ethical issues in technology right now. So that's his career path. I think it's really interesting and that's how he's getting there, legal informatics. <clears throat> Um, if you are interested also in know more about some of the uh, courses, contact me, I can give you my card and uh, we can have a conversation and put in touch with our instructors and faculty who've been developing these courses. The second certificate is the Human Computer Interaction Undergraduate Certificate. So this is a, a 15 credit online certificate, which uh, basically tackles, uh, uh, if you think about what Todd has just shared about the web, development, uh, web development, uh, if you think about uh, the construction of a large information system, web development engineering uh, basically tackles the actual construction and building of the information system. Like in construction engineering, you have also in need to have architects 
who think about the design of digital spaces. So human-computer interaction specialists are the architects of digital spaces, web engineers are equivalent to construction engineers actually building the spaces, and the two figures to work together, right? So you have architects who try to understand the requirements of the system, the requirements of the user, the stakeholders, the specifications, and the design, and then you have engineers who need to dialogue with designers and make sure that the system is implemented and correspond to the specification, and they learn the technologies that are continually changing to implement those designs. So in the field of computing, you see often these two figures uh, uh, working together. Human-computer interaction is a basically an introduction to the field of interaction design. Interaction design, so understanding the uh, types of user experiences you can have with your system, the type of system you want to design, what we call information architecture. So that metaphor means how to design information pieces and pages and services to accomplish specific goals, and what are the ways also to evaluate whether we, what we design corresponds to the needs of the user and the requirements. So the aspect of the evaluation and control experiments for the usability of the system uh, in this space. So this is a, an introductory uh, certificate. The type of careers that we talk about courses, they're not listed here, but they are typically interaction designer is a very common one that you find online, but also is often called UI UX designer. UI stands for user interface, UX user experience, they're interchangeable term in the industry. Um, and also UI UX researcher, when the uh, industry talks about UI UX researcher, they mean people who are able to interview users or stakeholders to understand the early stages of the design or information system, what are the organizational goals, what are the kinds of users we want to address, and translate those uh, desired needs into specification for further design. You have also <laughs> other profiles like usability specialist, some, somebody who comes in once the system has been developed, either by Lilly, could be a product for diabetes management, or by Salesforce, a digital marketing uh, platform, and need to evaluate whether marketers can use these tools effectively to accomplish their tasks, what are the pain points, the breakdowns, and then inform uh, the design team to address those. Uh, so this cycle of, of interaction design is covered by this uh, suite of courses. We have four introductory courses, Introduction to XCI Principle and Practices, the 200-level course, that is offered both online and in person. It also counts as a social ed, social science general ed requirement. We have introduction to design theory. There is theory underlying the, the field of, of interaction design that have to do with how we perceive things. So the field of psychology and understanding how we make sense of complexities when we navigate and memorize information and get oriented into the information space. Um, Human-computer interaction is about usability evaluation, the practice of usability testing, and the usability principle applied to a variety of different types of interfaces, not only web and mobile, but could be virtual reality, could be watches, could be glasses and emerging uh, uh, interfaces. We have also added over the years additional options for students because the field is changing. We have uh, now also a course fully dedicated on information visualization. This is the first course that we have at the undergraduate level, just about the perceptual elements of visualizing hundreds and thousands of data through charts and graphs to support insights making on behalf of users. Uh, we have also uh, experienced uh, design of accessibility. This accessibility which is understanding how we design websites, for example, for people who cannot look at the screen, but still need to navigate, blindly visually impaired. So all the technologies that have to do with reading aloud the screen, screen readers, either mobile or web, to allow them to access technologies. And then also conversational user interfaces, which are the emerging technologies like Amazon Alexa and uh, Google Home, how we design conversations and implement conversation to support specific tasks that could be useful. So this is a broad area, and uh, like legal informatics, this certificate kind of touches the surface and allows them people to Stories, highlights. It's time. Anything else? Any questions about legal or HCI? 
um, some of the certificates start out with courses that look like they're 200, 300 level. Um, are prerequisites a, a thing? There are no prerequisites for any, well, there are mostly not prerequisites for any of the HDI classes. Some of the courses that they choose at the end of the electives have requirements, like one is a grad class that's cross-listed as undergrad, so it requires instructor permission. Um, but most of them don't need to be taken in any order. We tend to have students start kind of with the first three of the 200, 300 level, just because I don't want them to choose their specialization, their elective class, until they know a little bit more about it. Um, and with legal informatics, there are no prerequisites, so they can jump in anywhere. Thank you. All right, thank you, Dominic. Thank you, thank you. I believe my part here. All right, up next we have medical coding, and I believe that there's a video I'm going to play first, Nicole, is that right? Mm -hmm. oh, you just have um, I'm going to put you in charge. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know what I was going Hello, everybody. My name is Lisa DeNoyers. I'm the program director for the Medical Coding Certificate and the Health Information Management Program. I wanted to tell you a little bit about this certificate and who's good candidates, what they're going to be doing, and what they can accomplish. Now, students who go into the certificate program are going to learn how to do ICD-10 and CPT coding. They'll be working with HIPAA, the law and ethics area, they learn reimbursement, insurance policy and procedure, and the big things that they're going to be doing works with regulations and policies regarding the medical records. One thing to note is that if they're doing this certificate program, they do have a practicum where they're going to do 240 hours hands on. This is virtually done, but it could be with a facility or with the virtual lab. It's important because this gives them their experience for them to be able to get better employment and during that course they're also going to be preparing and taking their credentialing exam in order to be a coder they have to get a credential and our job is to make sure that that happens now what do coders actually do everybody has this question the big thing to know is they translate the medical record for the insurance companies and make sure that the physicians or facilities get paid. Coders also, also audit and review their records to make sure that the information is there in order to get the correct treatment. They accept and review any payments for medical treatment. They balance those financial books and work with the facilities in this area. And the last thing is handling that billing and reimbursement for those facilities to work with the patients and their payments. There are prerequisites, and I want you to understand that when it comes to the anatomy and the physiology, the anatomy is only offered twice a year. The physiology is offered once a year. However, we do accept credits from the local community colleges. Those are accepted and transferred in, which means that if they choose to take the certificate and the class that they needed is not offered yet, they have the option to take that online from the community college and transfer it in to be able to get into the certificate program. The other classes that are required is the medical terminology and the intro concepts for health information, which is an intro course for computers where they learn about Microsoft Office, they learn about internet, and they learn about different technologies. Good candidates for this. Attention to detail is key. The in Enjoyment of sciences because they're going to learn a lot about the body and about the systems. This is core. They have to have a capability to work not only in groups, but alone, because most of their work will actually be done alone. They have to be self motivated and make sure that they're meeting deadlines because we work with both the government, the insurance companies and accrediting bodies to make sure that everything meets and exceeds all of the requirements. And the last thing is, of course, working with technology. We work with electronic coding systems. We work with different um, systems for the medical records. And of course, writing reports and, and 
building presentations are key. So they have a lot of technology that they work with in order to be a coder. Speaking of technology, your computer skills. We are going to actually teach them how to do PowerPoint, Excel, and Word because they're going to be core to what they learn. They're also going to be working with the AHIMA Virtual Lab. This is a one-time, once-a-year membership that they have to do in order to be able to work with a lot of different electronic systems and technology when it comes to the coding systems. They're going to work with the 3M coding system, which is inside the virtual lab. They're also going to do MindTap and do the EHR Go. This is a lot of technology, but we do you step by step in order for everybody to learn it and be able to work with it. Degrees that go really well with this certificate is the health information management degree, of course, because this certificate is actually the beginning portions of the health information management degree. And if students decide they can do multiple credentials in order to do this, the informatics degree, because this is technology based and we're teaching them a lot of technology. So it hits the ground running if they've already got some technology background. Nursing, radiology, and public health. Having all of those sciences, this certificate goes really well with that because they already have those prerequisites done and they're ready to hit the ground running when it comes to that coding area. Health services, this is a big one. This is a great certificate for health services because it gives them a credential going into their field in order for them to actually be able to work quickly and be able to exceed their management expectations. One thing I want you to know, this certificate is great for students to take early on because they can actually get a position in the healthcare field and get their feet wet while they're finishing up their degree. A lot of our local hospitals and stuff are also great about giving educational benefits. So if they get this coding credential, get the certificate done early, they get into the field, they will actually pay for them to finish up their degree. So less debt is always a good thing. Last thing, job titles after they complete this. They can become a clinical coder, an outpatient coder, an inpatient coder, become a reimbursement specialist, account reconciliation specialist, and if they choose to work with insurance companies, they can do medical preauthorization specializations. The big thing I want you to understand that when it comes to this, it's important to know that these different areas are just stepping stones for what they're looking to do. They will get the option to go into many other areas, but these are the starting bases for a lot of our coding credential students. We also work with Indiana University Hospital and they have a special um, intern program that this will actually help them get to a higher level as a coding specialist. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me. I would love to help you with any areas that need clarification. Again, my name is Lisa DeNoyers. I'm the program director for the medical coding certificate and the health information management program. Thank you for your time. Want to, um, so can I pull the yeah. I just want to highlight a few things that Lisa didn't talk about. The average salary for medical coders, according to the AHIMA salary survey, is $53,000. One thing to know about our profession, the HIM field, our program has been on campus for over 70 years. So we're one of the longest running on the campus. Um, and so Lisa talked about medical coding. We are KHIM accredited, so we go through a particular level of standards that we have to meet. We just went through our on-site review last year, and so we are accredited. And classes are offered both on campus and online. So if you have a student who's working, but they want to get, you know, something else, they want to go to the coding field, that they can do the program online. And with the medical coding practicum, what I do is I look to see, you know, are they working? Are they still 
um, you know, trying to get their foot in the door. And then I will place the students in a practicum site. And one of the things that's nice is Eskenazi, they offer an internship program where the students apply to be in the internship and then they're able to get a perspective on the revenue cycle. And so it's a 28 credit hour program. You can complete it in one year. And like Lisa said, it transitions nicely into a health information management profession. The other thing I know some of you are like radiology. Um, if the students decide that they don't want that face to face patient contact, but they still like that the medical component, they can go into medical coding. It's a good um, compromise. I will say there are still those 12 credits of prerequisites in addition yes. to 28 credits in the student. Right. Um, and so these, once you take the prerequisites, the first four, like Lisa mentioned, those are the prerequisites. These are the other classes that they will take. Can I ask about the anatomy and physiology? Sure. Um, in the video, she specifically mentioned the anatomy for, um, uh, yeah, for healthcare management. Um, will the traditional anatomy and physiology also satisfy the I think so, yes. And we've worked with them that they can take it virtually okay. as well. Does that expire? Some schools say if you don't have your anatomy or biology within the past seven years, then you have to take it over. Okay. Um, the practicum, again, is 240 hours. If a student is already working in the healthcare field, there is a possibility that, that their work experience can count towards their practicum. And then they sit for the AHIMA Certified Coding Associate exam. And so that's like the entry level coding exam. And we have almost 100% place or um, pass rate on the exam. So we have well prepared our students to sit for that exam. And then there's the plan of study. And so Lisa had mentioned these job roles and there are lots of jobs available in this maybe it's hard to find the mouse in that picture <laughs> there we go this is a great tool if you have a student's like okay what is him so this is a career map, and so you have. I think you can just exit out of that. Okay. And so this is the career map, and so you have all of the different, like the four major areas, and then if you, and then there's the entry level, the mid level, advanced, and the master level, and so if you click on these. You can see what the description is, the responsibilities, um, the work experience. And then at the bottom, there is on the AHIMA website, there's a salary survey. So, um, um, I do want Let's wrap it up. Yeah. Okay, the other thing that's like hot off the press is we have a post back certificate. This is something that has just been offered. It's on our website now and it's available um, starting January 1st. So like if you have a degree, you want HIM, then you can go into the post back program. Um, and if you're a health sciences, degree, then you may have to take less credit hours. So that's another option. And our program is STEM accredited, or our, our jobs are STEM. There are certain ones. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. We're like going on a big adventure across all these different <laughs> fields. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so our next one we're going to talk about will be virtual production with Zev and. I need a PowerPoint for you.
I think it's yep. right here. Yeah. All right, I'll give it over to you. Thank you, Taylor. Welcome to the school, everybody. My name is Zeb Wood. I currently direct the Media Arts and Science Bachelor's Program for the undergrad. Um, but Thomas Lewis will be the director next year, so please keep an eye on his name. He's really involved on campus and community as well. But today, what we're going to talk about is virtual production. And if you've watched, if you're film uh, lovers like we are, media arts and science, you've probably watched Mandalorian or any of the Disney Star uh, Star Wars enterprises. During COVID, a technology knows or a technology set of systems known as virtual production was uh, kind of adopted overnight. Uh, because we couldn't take our actors sliding around the world and film. We had to bring it all onto a stage with screens similar to the one you have here, uh, minus all of the seams. And then you'd put the actors in foreground elements like ships and, and uh, uh, you know, lightsabers and things in front of it with your actors and your director and your camera people. So it's very literally a combination of game makers, filmmakers, and 3D artists. And I myself am a 3D artist. So what we're doing is reaching out to all creatives on campus and in the uh, local Midwestern industry and saying we, we're creating classes that honor those three disciplines and then we throw them together for a final, final uh, team-based project at the end of the certificate. We're missing that last, I'm not sure why that happened, but the sixth course, it's 18 credits. The sixth course is called Beyond the Frame, it's taught by Thomas himself. And it's where we put all those people in the same room to make a miniature film, virtual production film. Uh, but uh, this isn't just one job, there are many jobs. And those jobs uh, extend to our bachelor's degree students. So I would say, um, you know, the 3D classes in the certificate will have the same job titles for virtual production projects. Um, they will be creating the worlds and any assets that live in the uh, digital environment that replicates the real world. Um, and then we place those in game engines, which we'll get to here in a second. So uh, we have two or one 3D course, two game design courses, introductory and intermediate, and two film <laughs> courses, followed by the, uh, the final beyond the frame. Okay? So you get to know the language and the operational know-how of each of those trades, how to tell a story, uh, and then how to bring that story together with the current technology. Um, so our 3D animators, you would be doing things like making the, the environments, the characters, the creatures that are digital. Um, our alumni work all over the world. Um, literally, we have, we have one student that moved to Malta in the spring working for 4A, uh, a game company that's world, world known. Um, but we have students that stay here and re uh, work remotely for Rockstar and Pipeworks and some companies out west too. Our, the second part of the recipe in the certificate is getting to, used to developing content, creating sets in game engines. And that's where the magic happens, where we can combine the filmmaker's camera, the actor in front of the screen, and the virtual world in uh, a game engine was, is what's projected onto the actor. So the game design and development students and the students that take those classes end up set dressing what would normally be in the real world. Okay? High, high demand area and, and more and more people moving towards game design for filmmaking. And then finally, we have our traditional filmmakers. Without them, we couldn't make the films, even though we're all kind of in the same room. Now, uh, we need everybody from the director and the script writers and the concept artists to somebody that holds the camera uh, and gets the final image and edits that movie. Uh, so a lot of different jobs, but putting them together on the same time, uh, teams and getting used to how each other work and, and articulating create, create a vision and story is where the magic happens for virtual production and something that's happened separately for the last hundred years of filmmaking. Um, so what are those pieces of art work like and what types of students might want the certificate? Uh, very much creative students in either writing or visual communications at Heron. Uh, folks that are interested in games, films, or 3D would also be perfect for this. Uh, here's a little bit of our student work. Here's my cursor. It's somewhere around here. I can see it hovering. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. It's a phantom. <laughs> there we go. I got it anyway. That's why they get me. So this is all student work, and this is usually what seals the deal. 
of your students or certificate students that in virtual production they'll be working on projects that look like this. We have a lot of Students that want to stay close to home, Chicago and Atlanta are where a lot of virtual production uh, stages are being made and also Nashville for music videos and broadcast. Um, but there's rumors and I'm on a few proposals for Indianapolis as well, especially for sports broadcast and, uh, and more and more filmmaking with some film incentives that have passed recently. Um, I've still got the phantom guy. Let's do the alt tab trick here. <laughs> So unlike all the other certificates, we're definitely dealing with artists, folks that want to tell stories and uh, kind of inspire audiences. We also offer a study abroad that's not so abroad, it's to LA. And that is in partnership with IU School of, Bloom uh, School of Media in Bloomington. And we send our students out to Hollywood for a semester or a summer. And they get, uh, on average, our students from this campus have two internships for that time and uh, most of them don't come back even though we want them to. That, that was kind of their goal to uh, escape Indiana and go to Hollywood. Um, we also have some awesome student groups that typically are, are working on these projects outside of assignments and doing, doing bigger and bigger things as well with industry. So I'll stop there, see if you guys have any questions. It's a very different certificate compared to the rest of my colleagues today. If you're curious about this technology, there's some really cool videos you can find online. Um, Disney Plus has a couple behind the scenes short documentaries in the making of The Mandalorian. If you're watching any of the new Star Trek shows, um, <laughs> Discovery and Strange New World are being shot on these kinds of stages. And you can find YouTube videos that look crazy of people just walking around these stages that look like what we see on the screen. It's a really unique um, kind of time in the entertainment industry. Uh, for example, I have lots of calls with many companies that say, hey, we need somebody that knows Unreal, but has film experience or knows Unreal and is a 3D artist because the old dogs don't want to learn new tricks. So all these students are just getting picked up by the biggest companies. Um, so I would think, you know, especially Heron students or CGT students in engineering or some writing students and communications would be like direct perfect fits for this. But um, everybody loves movies and this is a very, uh, very quick way to get into that industry as well. Do, do visual, sorry, do visual communications classes from Ivy Tech transfer into this at all? We have a killer articulation agreement yeah, with Ivy full, Tech. Yeah. For the full BS, right? Yeah, for the arts. full BS. So any students that were taking 3D courses would get the transfer credit for that certificate. Um, our Indianapolis Ivy Tech doesn't have any games courses, but they do have film courses, so those would count as well, the intro and the intermediate. Thanks for that question, yeah. yeah. So any Ivy it? Tech Indianapolis students that took yeah. their film and 3D courses would only have two classes left. Okay, I'll switch it again. Yeah. Do you know Nathan Jones? Do you already I don't know him? Nathan, I know John Perez. Okay. Yeah. Okay. yeah, he and I talk a lot. Okay. It looks like there might be a question in the chat. Oh, Ooh. hopefully it's my friend Brian. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Catherine. We expect to see you next semester. Retweet. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Sign us up. Yeah. <laughs> Get students, sign us up. <laughs> so during COVID, we tried it on this screen, you know, minus the seams. It's a lot of fun and having usually, you know, just separate faculty and students that, you know, have their own classes for, together for the first time just feeds on that energy. And I think that's why we'll see more and more movies made like that. So I right. think I haven't messed up anything. I think you're good. Watch out for the phantom mouse. <laughs> All right, we just have one more, well, really two more certificates that we are going to visit. I feel like I finally figured out the alt tab situation. All right, Fozzie, you're up to talk about artificial intelligence. Yeah. I forgot to move the chat. Let me get in there. All right, there you go. The PowerPoint, you might have to take All right. Uh, hello, everybody. My name is Fazi Bin Masad. I'm going to talk to you about the Software Bots and Cognitive Automation Certificate. This is actually comes at a perfect time, and I'm not saying that because I'm biased. It's simply because the world that we live in, it's pretty much everything is either driven by extreme connectedness and explosion of data, or uh, extreme bot and automation everywhere, and it's also you know cloud computing driving everything. And not to, of course, forget that something that I've been saying for years and people either cringe or think I'm a crazy when I say, I have ops will rule our world. Uh, <laughs> but it's happening right now. So that's going to come to the past where AI ops is pretty much is driving every single, whether it's cyber or physical or the information communication technology system, et cetera. And that's because AI and cognitive computing is pretty much, you know, our future. So this certificate is basically 16 hours and there's four courses four core courses, starting with some uh, programming in Python, and then uh, uh, an impact of bots in uh, cognitive automation, and then uh, enterprise in cognitive automation, and then uh, the final course, the fourth uh, uh, as part of this course, cognitive automation bot development. Now, the idea behind this is that this is to focus on literally the design and the use of AI and cognitive automation that includes robotic process automation, for example, includes intelligent process automation in AI ops to address the conversions, this total conversion between business, organization, technology, and their digital transformation. So in layman terms, that's saying like the marriage between business and technology and their collaboration to either solve problems or to address opportunity or to create opportunity. And there's nothing that uh, actually that we know that is not about, okay, for business organization technology, it's all about three things. It's all about insights, or it's about user experience, as David talked about earlier, or it's about automation. So this certificate does address this, uh, these three main things that pretty much drive business organization initiative. Take, for example, uh, insights. That's about using machine learning, deep learning, or using machine learning operations. So for example, you can look at historical data, or you can look at uh, current data, et cetera, and then you can identify patterns. You can uh, look at predicting stuff that's going to happen to the business or the organization. Think, for example, AI analytics. When it comes to user experience, that's about like using natural language processing or generating or understanding. So, for example, you can include either computer vision or video, et cetera, so you can make the experience of the user much richer. richer. Think, for example, uh, human computer interaction. Okay, human computer interaction when it comes to user experience, it's like patient provider. I'm going to give you some examples so this will make sense. Okay, patient provider, for example, or customer service, etc. And I'll give you some examples that address to all these so it'll make a better sense. Uh, if I'm talking too fast, that's because I only have 10 minutes, right? <laughs> so the other thing is about automation. Okay, so this certificate does address automation in the sense of cognitive automation or AI or use of AI ops for automation. That includes, for example, using robotic process automation. So you can have, for example, either you can create a digital workforce or you can create actually think, for example, uh, uh, enterprise RPI. So let me jump to, uh, well, I'll say something else about uh, what's interesting about the certificate, okay? Uh, as I said, 16 hours, 16 credit hours with an elective, but uh, four out of the courses uh, in this certificate are pretty much also aligned with professional industry certification. Uh, in partnership with some of these providers, take for example, uh, impact of AI cognitive and, uh, in um, cognitive automation. It's aligned to two certificates. 
One is the AI system developer from Raza, or that's level one. And the other one is uh, an AI conversational designer uh, and developer that's from another, um, another AI provider that we, we had a partnership with. Uh, for example, the course cognitive automation bot development is aligned and mapped, and the students also get that certificate once they pass that exam. And in a partnership with these guys, the students don't have to pay for the exams because we partner with these providers. So they get the certificate as an advanced AI system developer. Uh, for uh, uh, enterprise cognitive automation, our partnership with uh, Automation Anywhere. So, so, for example, they get the certificate of RPI Mass. Okay, and there's some advanced levels on that too. And then we're working with the AWS to also get the certificate included in deep learning. So they will have machine learning, the AWS machine learning. Now, um, this is a busy slide, so I'm gonna, not going to go over it so much, but I'll show you some examples okay, of that. Uh, how do these certificates or these professional industry certificates built or embedded into this AI certificate uh, work? It's because we're covering so many things from these different, from these aligned professional certification. Take, for example, impact of AI and cognitive automation. So we go there, you know, what's covered in that is not just the rise of cognitive bots, but for example, you know, how do you use software bots to create virtual assistant, okay? Uh, not Alexa or Siri because they're not your virtual assistant, but to create your own virtual assistant. So students will go through different examples like, okay, that includes like, you know, use cases like bodifying education or bodifying politics and then talk about the impact of that. Like when you bodify politics, you can destroy election, you can destroy democracy or you can uphold dem uh, democracy, you can change the fate of, demo uh, of uh, election and so forth. Or bodifying religions and the impact of like you got several AI, uh, AI gods uh, these days. Is uh, in fact, there's one in the West Coast, a very like known AI god, and there's one in the in the East, another AI god. So that's happening. This is when I say, like I said, when I say AI ops will rule our world, people go, oh, no, but it's happening, right? So the other things is to give you an example. I'll come back to here, um, the jobs. But here's an example of you using AI ops, which I give this in one of the courses, in one of the bot courses to our students. When you think about using AI ops as an example, you have, for example, this mute person, okay? Uh, and this is in a final course project, one of the courses, okay? A mute person cannot communicate with somebody else. It's very hard unless they use sign language. You know, as it is in sign language, okay, everybody have an accent. When I talk, I have an accent. Everybody else have an accent. They may talk fast, they may talk slow, they may talk with a, you know, a funny accent, whatever. The same thing with mutes, okay? When people are communicating sign language, because some people have fat fingers, some people have short fingers, some people, you know, they sign very fast, some people they sign very slow, etc. So the idea is that you can use AI ops to teach using the model uh, in machine learning uh, model. So you can teach the teach, teach this AI system different ways people sign. Okay, and then convert use that then use uh, uh, AI vi computer computer vision as part of that. So you can convert somebody signing into a language that the person can understand. And going backward is the same way. So you have a person that's speaking to the mute going through this. Uh, natural language processing as they talk, converting that with computer vision, and then the mute, they can see it, okay? And then the sudden you have complete, okay, you, you've actually pretty much closed the gap between communicating with uh, mutes or mutes communi communicating with us. It doesn't matter in what language at that point, right? Another example I'm going to give you here, I'll come back to this, but I'll give you an example of it's done, done by our students um, or something that covered. For example, robotic process automation in enterprise, okay? Recently, somebody was saying in conference last week, I was listening, I was talking to him. It takes every organization sometimes $16 to prove it, to actually to put together one invoice. Okay, imagine that, 16 hours and then someone working on it like one to two hours. Why? It's because they have to, every enterprise has got so many different systems. They've got an electronic record processing system, they've got a customer relationship management system, they've got an email system, they've got a scheduling system, they use Salesforce for their for different things, they use SAP for their, you know, for their financial, et cetera. So by the time that person have to pull things from different systems to build an invoice, that takes a lot of time, that takes a lot of resource. Imagine Eli Lilly, for example, when they do RPI or robotic process automation as part of their, at the sudden, you've got this bot that can fetch, for example, the custom from the CRM system can fetch the, the information about the, that, that person or that client. Okay, and then go into the SAP to find out about, you know, what they need to be charged, what they owe, et cetera, et cetera. And then go to the, and then log into the email, send them that email, or produce an invoice and send an email system to send it to them. Okay, I know a bot, okay, doing that, or 
bunch of partners part of this RPA doing that will do like instead of doing like one invoice in one or two hours, they can do maybe a thousand. Okay, so this is the same thing as multiplying. Okay, taking the production of one person and multiplying by a thousand, right? And then suddenly that's the end. That, that's I mean that's the significance of uh, robotic process automation. Okay. Two minute warning. Two minutes. <laughs> then I'm gonna, well, a good example here I'll share with you. Uh, that was done by uh, in from uh, our students. Okay, so here we're um, uh, we had the students actually use, for example, conversation-driven design to create a software bot that can you know do the user experience. So here you have uh, an HM patient, okay, sitting from home. They don't need to go to drive to the doctor, sit, you know, waste an hour, sit for the, sit an hour to wait for a doctor for only 15 minutes just to get an answer to a question that, you know, they, they could have got it in less than two minutes. Okay. So by them going through some channels using this bot, that that then sends that message to, or the bot takes that message, and then through using application programming uh, interface, they can find the answer from their system, and look at their ERP says uh, their. Uh, um, uh, EMR system, and then find the information and then send it back to them, and that will be the end of it. So I'm going to go back here to uh, talk about jobs, because, oops. Okay, there's that ghost again. Oh, no. Oh. Sorry, I think you're in health information management now. Great. Well, <laughs> That's fine. I was going to talk about the topic jobs. Okay, there's all kind of topic jobs that, and who can actually uh, go for the certificate? It could be an informatics student, it could be a computer science student, or it could be any, any anybody who's actually looking at changing their career to get into the jobs of today and tomorrow, basically. Okay, and then some of this. Um, there will be yeah, if you go down to the slide. Uh, this one. Yeah, uh, up. One more. One more. One more. One more. One more. One more. There we go. Okay. So here we're talking about jobs, for example. Mm. Oh, never mind. Oh. That's okay. It's the, it's the ghost mouse. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I was going to be fancy. So, for example, to be an AI assistant developer, or it could be, for example, you know, an RPI architect, okay? Uh, or it could be someone who does uh, automation software engineer that, you know, that looks at, that looks at, you know, that marriage between business and uh, organization and technology again, to solve a problem, or it could be, for example, uh, a software boss designer, okay? All these are different jobs that this certificate would lead to, particularly when they get this professional certification or this, uh, or this industry certification. Something interesting about RPI, for robotic process automation, okay, some of the jobs, the national average for a robotic process automation person, okay, uh, engineer, not in system mechanical engineer or electronic engineer, but engineer, someone who's, you know, looks at the processes, business organization processes, and then align them to, uh, to meet, uh, to solve a problem or an opportunity. That's $112,000 uh, uh, 112, uh, a year, okay, which is very significant. So with that, I'm out of time, so I'm going to okay. stop and see if so you guys Thank have you questions. Yeah. Is that how long until I can control an army of digital robots? Because <laughs> <laughs> I have lots of tasks. Yeah, that's, that, you can do that right now. Okay. Come on, and some are doing it. Okay. That is not uh, a sci-fi, or that's not something in the future. That's actually happening today. It so, is wonderful. Well, questions, thanks. comments, or we're done. I think we're done. All right. Yeah. Thank, thank you so much. All right. So we have about ten minutes left in our time together. I'm gonna. Hopefully, very quickly, I want to talk about one last thing before we open it up for general Q&A about everything we discussed today. Um, but I did mention that we are a partner with a state program called the Indiana Next Level Jobs Program. So what is the Next Level Jobs Program? Um, the state of Indiana has a big emphasis right now on workforce development, job training, and getting people into high paying skilled careers that are in demand at the moment. So they have a grant program right now called the Workforce Ready Grant that will actually pay for a student to go through a training program at no cost to them. Um, this program is funded by the state of Indiana. Um, a lot of different kinds of entities can be job training providers, not just universities, companies, nonprofits. Um, Ivy Tech is a huge provider and partner in this in this venture. And then we have three certificates as part of this program that I'll talk about in a second. I think we are the first um, 
at IUPUI, and then the only other IU program that's um, a training provider is at IU South Bend in medical coding as well. Um, now, in order for a program to be approved to, to fall under this, and they need to be related to these high growth fields that the state has identified in advanced manufacturing, building and construction, health and life sciences, IT and business services, and transportation and logistics. Now, um, when a student um, finds a program they're interested in on the state's website um, that um, is going to train them to go into the field they want to go into, they can receive full tuition and fees if they meet the eligibility requirements. Now, in order for a student to be eligible, they must be an Indiana resident. So this does rule out our undocumented students living here in the state of Indiana. So that's something that's good to know when you're counseling students. They must have less than an associate's degree already. The state wants to fund students who don't already have a credential or a degree of some kind. Um, they can't have already used the Workforce Ready Grant. It's a one and done grant. They can't use it multiple times to get multiple certifications. They have to submit the FAFSA for the, the academic year that they plan on enrolling. And then they have to be admitted to the program through whatever institution they are applying to. So for IPY, they have to meet full admission standards. We are trying to work on some alternate admission pathways right now for people who might you know, come from non-traditional backgrounds, but we're working on it. More things to know is that students can only receive this grant for two years. If they are unable to complete their program in two years, funding runs out, they have to pay out of pocket for the remainder of that program. Um, there are some requirements. If a student is dependent, dis determined by the FAFSA, they must be enrolled in their courses full time. If they are independent, they can go part time the full two years. This grant is also a last dollar award. So if a student is already receiving the 21st century um, scholarship, the O'Bannon grant, um, they will receive those awards first, and then this will fill in on the back end. So it does not stack with other state awards that a student might receive. All right, finally, what are our eligible programs? Multi-device development, the boot camp in website and mobile application development is eligible for the grant. So a student can complete our boot camp, and if they're eligible, pay no money and tuition and fees to complete it. They can also do the normal format, and it can be completed in under two years to meet that requirement. Our applied information science certificate, not data science, is approved. Um, this past summer, we, um, we did a trial summer boot camp format where students could complete the whole certificate over two summer sessions. This is also offered in the normal format as well. And then finally, our medical coding certificate. This one does have an asterisk. Those 12 prerequisites are currently not covered by the grant. So students will have to pay for them first or use another funding source. And then the 28 credits in the certificate are covered. Now, the state prefers to fund students who are only pursuing these certificates. So that's what the state prefers, but it's not what is happening. Students who are degree seeking in other areas who are taking these courses are also being covered right now by the state. They may change that in the future. There are, the state has told us they're going to overhaul the program and like look at eligibility requirements. So this is how it is right now, but there are opportunities for students to be trained in these areas at no cost to them. So I wanted to put that out there, let you all know about it. So how does student, would a student need to contact you if they want to apply for the grants? Or? So how it works is that it is automatic. If they have applied for admission, they have added on the certification that they're seeking it, like it's on their plan, and if they've um, submitted the FAFSA. So then it should be offered to them automatically as state aid. So there's no other application that they need to fill out. But I am the primary program contact for our school. So I've worked with students who are in all sorts of weird situations. So if they think they should get the grant and they're not, send them my way. I work with Lisa Bridgewater in the financial aid office on those, those students. Okay. All right. We have five minutes left together. And I'm going to go ahead and pull up our websites. and our list of certifications. Okay, we have talked about a million things today, and we have really gone on um, a marathon, but what questions are rolling around in your mind that you wanna get answered? And I'm here, we also have Alicia Hadley, our Director of Advising here, if you have any of those more nitty gritty advising questions about these programs. 
So I wanted me to make sure virtual production was shown on the screen. <laughs> We had any students come right out of high school and do one of the certificate programs a couple. without necessarily having the intention of yeah. doing a bachelor's degree first. Handful. And I think they're, they are enrolled right now, I believe. And as you probably know, that's hard because they're not going to get that full freshman experience. Right. Um, but when I work with students, I let them know that when they're a certificate student, they're still a full IPY student. They get access to our advising team, our career services team. They can be involved in student organizations. They still get all of these resources that are here to help them persist, and they're not just alone. And that's especially important to emphasize because many of these certificates can be completed completely online. And not online students still have access to all these resources. So we really try to push that and let them know that there's people here to help them complete the certificate. Um, can you talk about, uh, in thinking about the advising that yeah. is provided for these certificates um, in, in university college, right? Mm -hmm. We would often have students who are pre-majors, yeah. um, maybe not even within SOIC. Yeah. Um, if they have an interest in declaring one of these certificate options, what, after they take that step, yeah. What happens? Is someone in touch with them to, to provide guidance and and be their academic advisor? What can Alicia, you, do you want to talk about that? Um, so, I mean, it, so all they do to apply is reach out to our recorder who adds it. So we don't necessarily, so you mean like if they're currently in something and they add a certificate, yep. we don't always, we don't always know about them okay. in an immediate way. They'll get like just added into everything like suddenly they're just in the caseload and they're just part of it. Mm -hmm. um, so they're going to like by the next cycle get in, but if they're doing multi device it's one semester. Mm -hmm. So it's best if you recommend that they just reach out to whoever would be their advisor at the school. Mm -hmm. um, and that way, because like, for instance, with multi device, they have to apply for graduation when they start the program, which is weird like welcome to this program apply for graduation because it's within the same semester. So that's like a weird one off that you don't always think about. Right. So it's best if they reach out. Um, a lot of certificate students, you know, we kind of just give here are the classes, here's a general order, fit it in with the other things that you have. And then they'll sometimes meet with us and sometimes they won't. And that's sometimes we'll just email and say, this is what I'm doing. Is that okay? And we'll say, yes, yes. or, you know, no. Right. Yes. <laughs> yeah. But I think if you're working with the students, good to let them know they still have an assigned advisor in our school. That's still a yeah. resource that they have to reach out to. And we even reach out to them for registration, and then sometimes they'll come and it's like, oh, actually, it's just for the student. So um, I'm happy to talk to you about that. They're like, well, what about my computer science class? It's like, I don't know. <laughs> good question. We have a lot of flexibility with some of the classes. so. Like with multi device, you have both Ivy Tech credits. Even with CIT and computer science, there are equivalencies with basically everything in our school, which makes it very complicated because um, you can't remember all. I mean, we can barely remember all of the things. Um, so if you ever have a question with a student where it's like, well, they had this class, it was kind of like this, just have them reach out to us because we know a lot of we know a lot of secret things and we're pretty flexible. So. I want to emphasize that Alicia and her team do a great job of being student focused and trying to maximize the credit they already have, making sure that they're not duplicating what they've already done. So we do have a culture here of trying to help the students as much as possible use what they've already done. Trying to make it work. Yeah. So I know it's 1.30 and that's the end of our allotted time, but I don't have anything after this if anyone wants to stay and ask questions. Um, but at this time, you're free to go if you've got somewhere to be. Thank you all so much for coming and hanging out with us. And then if you want, there's folders with some uh, brochures per certificate and t-shirts, stuff you can take on your way out. Cool sweat. Thanks for having us. Thanks for coming. This really, this really, is, all these programs are cool. They are. They're all, I mean, just, yeah. I agree. Yeah. And then we did record this session and we'll send it out after two to everybody. Thank you, Posse. Oh, sure. Yeah, is this your yes. oh, okay. yeah. Is there a, a, a little water? Yeah. 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 Yeah
Yeah. Yep. Thank you, Sarah. Okay. All right. I'll stop sharing.